بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We stated that in the case of Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu alayhi he had this relationship with Allah in which he understood the nothingness of his own self and the absolute state of favor from God upon him. He also understood that his God intends the best for him in whatever comes to him to the extent that he trusts Allah with a deep sense of trust to the extent that he would not want from Allah anything that Allah does not want for him. He would not resist the decree and the destiny of God. If he understood that the destiny of God was final, then he would embrace the destiny of God. And through embracing the destiny of God wholeheartedly, he would try to find God through it. He understood well that he himself could not chart out the course of his life better than Allah could for him. In that way, he gave over his fears and anxiety to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one thing that we need to understand. Fear, anxiety, resistance from the decree of God is what ruins our lives. It is something that puts us in a state of perpetual bondage, always struggling against the will of God. There has to come a time where we acknowledge deep within ourselves, O oh Lord, what you choose for me is the best for me. And hence Hussein ibn Ali makes a dua, O oh Lord, make your decree for me the best decree and bring the best out for me in the destiny that you have planned for me. O oh Allah, let there be no hesitation in this chest or heart from accepting what you want from me. When this happens, you can imagine how the human soul becomes liberated. But at the same time, there is a lot of relief at a psychological state when we can understand what we are doing. We are engulfed in this world, in the veils of this world. Allah says in the Quran, Today I have removed your veils. Your sight has become sharper than a blade. You see today what you saw not yesterday. At that point the human being is confronted with a state of regret. If only I were to have trusted in Allah during the momentary life that I had. Hussein ibn Ali says this to his sister, these are but a few days. Your tribulations are great, but they shall not last. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate for this in ways that you cannot understand. He had understood this. He was now consoling her and telling her that whatever is happening is happening for a reason. He himself says at the fall of Akbar, and we stated this, that what makes this easy, O Lord, is that you witness this with me. You share in this grief with me. You know very well what is happening. And since you know what is happening, and it is through your consent, not your fault, but through your consent, this gives me heart to bear with it. That if my Lord has chosen this, then there is the best outcome that he intends in this for me. When we go beyond this, 
in examining the relationship that Hussein has with his Allah, we come to another stage. We come to a stage in which we find Hussein very genuine and authentic with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He not only embraces the decree of Allah, but he displays his humanness in that embracing of decree. He is not pretentious. If he is frightened, then he acknowledges his fear. If he is in need, then he acknowledges his need with Allah. What happens often in our lives is that we are not authentic with God. The reason we are not authentic with God is because we have not known God. We are so accustomed in this life to lead a pretentious life in which there are all sorts of demands upon us and we need to perform. In the whole of this role play, we forget ourselves. Allah reminds us, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبْ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to him than his jugular vein. We know what his soul inspires him of the evil and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. Allah again reminds us that when your souls or your spirits reach the hulqum, and at that point you begin to see with clear vision, and we are closer to it than you are. Allah again explains, Allah 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 comes between a man and his own heart. Even prior to your intimate thoughts, Allah says, you are with me. Now Hussein turns to Allah and he says, O oh Lord, how may I express myself when prior to my expression, whatever is within me is open to you and known by you? O oh Allah, with what words shall I present my state to you when none of my states are hidden from you? He acknowledges Allah in that deepest sense. And he arrives at a point of utmost confidence with God where he can be himself. The greatest tribulation upon the heart and mind of the son of Adam is this lack of acknowledgement of God at that intimate level. We are afraid of what we are. Our fear of the other, of what the other might think of us, is only because we have not acknowledged our own selves. Since Arif is hidden from his own self, a pretentious person is presented to his people. But if he was open to his own self, the genuine person will be available for all to see. Rumi says so beautifully, O oh man, O oh you who curse Yazid and Shimr, and O oh you who laments Hussein, look deep within yourself. You shall find your Hussein as oppressed as Hussein, the son of the Prophet. You will find your Yazid butchering your Hussein as Shimmer butchered the Hussein, son of the Prophet. You will find that your Yazid devours your own Hussein. Awaken to the truth of your own self. We are not available to our own selves. What happens here is that when we die and the veils are lifted, the first thing that happens is we begin to get a glimpse of what we were. But the greatest loss is that some people will proceed into the hereafter and on the day of judgment and even at that point they will not acknowledge their own self. They will be hidden from their own selves even there. Allah says Allah will not talk with them. Allah says Allah will not look at them. Why would Allah not look at them? He sees all. Because there is nothing to be seen. The real person is hidden away. There is no person there. He is not there. A pretentious person has emerged. And until and unless he drops his guard and leaves the pretense, how can God look at him? And how can God talk to him? You are talking to an actor. You are not talking to me. When God talks to me today in the Quran, he is not talking with me. He is talking to a make-believe personality. When was I ever that I can claim that I am? Allah says, but like cattle they are. Nay, worse than the cattle. At least the cattle is aware of his own function. 
this man having this phenomenal treasure of God within him, he is asleep and unaware of his self. The Blessed Prophet said, People are asleep. When they die, they awaken. What a regretful state it is for us to awaken at the point of departure when the whole journey ends. Isn't it a great shame and a great waste that we come to this world to find God? This is the only task at hand, as Hussein says, that now from the way I have observed things, the so carefully and meticulously planned things, the only objective of yours from me was that I recognize you in every affair and through every affair. And that is the only one thing that I have not recognized. Isn't it the greatest crisis and the greatest loss that the whole objective of life was to find Allah and when I begin to die, I cry out to you to save my life. Which Allah have I found? Had I found Allah, I would not cry out to you to save me. I would say to Allah as the Prophet said, O oh Lord, if death is good for me, then take me. If life is better for me, then leave me. Isn't that what we would say? Or as Hussein says in this dua, O oh Lord, I called you in a state of sickness and you cured me. In a state of poverty and you made me needless. In a state in which I had so many enemies and you gave me victory. The greatest shame is that this life was all about finding God. The only one thing we have not found is God. And at the point of death we are so frightened, aren't we? We are alive for dying. Do we know this? I live to meet with death because death is my examination room. I am walking towards death. The door is open. I am going to enter therein. How foolish am I? I have put blindfolds on my eyes and I'm walking towards that room and once I approach it and I'm gripped with fear that here I am but you've been walking towards it all your life. This has been your only calling. Why didn't you awaken? You were supposed to find this truth. The only thing that mattered you abandoned and everything else that did not matter was your objective. Tell me something. For me to earn the kingdom of the earth of what good is it? Even if I got the kingdom of Suleiman, life is escaping me bit by bit. What good is the kingdom of Suleiman? The greatest kingdom for me is to restrain life, but I can't restrain it. It is escaping with every breath. How amazing is the state of the son of Adam. His death is crying out from within him, I'm coming. You're giving yourself up. And I'm building palaces. That beautiful angel calls out, Build for destruction, give birth for death. So Hussein at this point teaches us to form this very authentic, beautiful bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which we are available to Allah in a state in which we are unembarrassed of God and of ourselves. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him a friend, calls himself a friend. I often wonder, he is a parent, he is a mother, he is a father, he is a brother, he is the unending army, he is the physician, he is the support, he is all of these beautiful things. Yet he chooses to call himself the friend. Why is this? Because as Hussein says, O oh Lord, should I turn to my mother whose welcoming lap will become unwelcoming if she knew of me? Should I turn to my family who will turn their faces away if they saw from me what you see? O oh Lord, who do I have but you who will accept me as I am? We need a friend who is so unjudgmental, so loving, so caring, whose company is so potent and therapeutic, who is so loving and caring and gentle, that we helplessly melt away and we loosen our guard and we begin to embrace. And through that we begin to see ourselves and begin to face ourselves. 
the greatest challenge for the human being is to face themselves. We can't face ourselves. Hussein teaches this. This beautiful, beautiful, proximate bonding with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Catholics have one thing in their faith which is very good and we all need this. And that is the confession box. Now it might have gone wrong. Every noble tradition goes wrong somewhere. But I'm talking about it in principle. And I know people are smiling here because they know what is, I know what is in their minds. Salawat. It's a noble tradition in essence. And it should be practiced. Why do people go to the confession box? In order to relieve themselves of pretense. In order to acknowledge. In order to let it go. The burden is too much. Let it go. We need to have this somewhere. We need to confide in somebody. We need to have that confidence. So the confession box is that barrier in which you do not see. But the ear that hears you is a non-judgmental ear. It's the ear of God. They hear you. They accept your acknowledgement. And they say, now do this in turn and you're cleansed. What happens there is you walk away, a confident person being able to face your own self. And until that happens, the real person does not even come into existence. So Hussein teaches this in this beautiful journey of his on Ashura and prior to Ashura in his beautiful duas. He says, O Lord, allow me to be myself. I know your decree is final, but you know that I want other than it. You know that is my human condition. And in front of you, O oh dear friend, dear Lord, I will be myself. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts us at that point, then we find this relief and release within us. So the difference that we need to understand here in the approach of Hussein and between the approach that religion has taught us is that religion brings about a formalistic relationship between the, between the creature and God. Hussein brings a relationship in which formalities break. When Ali cries out, Man li ghayruk, as'aluhu kashfa dhurri wa nadhara fi amri, who do I have other than you, O Lord, that I can cry upon? Who else do I have? Here, Ali, Ali Salamullah in his humanness, is displaying the gems of that intimacy and proximity with God, in which he is talking to a friend and almost complaining to a friend with a right upon that friend. I have abandoned all. Who do I have other than you? You know my sense of Tawheed will not allow me to bring anybody bef between me and you. I have given everything away. Lord, who do I have? Which door should I run to if your door is not available to me? Oh Lord, point me in that direction. And if that direction doesn't agree, ex exist, then in that case, listen to what I have to say. So Hussein ibn Ali teaches us that beyond the religious relation, relationship that the servant has with God, there is a relationship that a friend has with a friend. We go from a formalistic God to a personal God. Now with that God, there are no words, there are no expressions, there are no formalities. That is a God with whom you can be yourself. So Hussein says, Ilahi, minni ma yaliku below me, wa minka ma yaliku bi karamik. He says, O oh Lord, I come to you. I acknowledge fully that from me is everything through which blame comes on me. But O oh Lord, you are the one from whom nothing but graciousness and goodness comes. How beautiful is this approach to God? Oh God, I've acknowledged myself. You know who I am. You know what I am. From me is nothing but lack, but from you is nothing but beauty. Now he is not saying this in a calculated manner in his mind. He is opening his heart to a friend. He is saying, oh friend, 
Be with me in accordance with your beauty. Do not be with me in accordance with my eligibility. You be with me, which is befitting you. Often we are told in the Hadith literature and religious literature that when somebody does wrong to you, do not reciprocate. For if you reciprocate, you have failed the test because you have dropped from your pedestal. It's a test from God. If somebody behaves with you in a less than a befitting manner, respond in accordance with what you are capable of responding in the best possible godly manner. Instead of letting the other lower you, let your response elevate the other. This is what Hussein ibn Ali is saying to God. From me is nothing but this despicableness, but from you is nothing but graciousness. He comes into this intimacy with God and he says, and he does not feel embarrassed to share his fears. That strong Hussein, defiant Hussein, that Hussein that stands in front of 30,000 blades, in him is expressing his inadequacies to his Lord. He is the pillar of strength for all, is he not? But in front of his God, he is a person that requires that strength. He says, "Anta kafi hina tu aina ni al madahib fi saatiha, wa tu diqu al ardu bima rahubat." O oh Allah, you are the cave in which I retreat when I can bear the world's tribulations no more. You are the one I turn to when the expanded earth becomes constricted upon me. He says. وَأَنْتَ مُوَيِّدِي بِالنَّسْرِ عَلَىٰ عَدَائِي And O oh Lord, you are the one who will give me victory over my enemies. وَلَوْ لَا نَسْرُكَ إِيَّايَ لَكُنْتُ مِنَ الْمَغْلُوبِينَ And had it not been for your assistance of me, I would have indeed become overpowered. We see, we see Hussein in Karbala, who is so defiant, so strong, that we would not think that there is any fear in his soul. What happened was that the fear in his soul is compensated for by his pillar of strength. His pillar of strength are not the arms of Abbas. His pillar of strength are the arms of God. The love of his heart is not Akbar. The love of his heart is the Lord of Akbar. So he arrives at that level of proximity with God, in which he is very, very genuine. He shares with his God very, very openly. And he says to Allah, and so beautifully, he sits with God, and he opens his heart, and he says, Ya man da'autuhu maridan fashafani. O Lord, you are the one who I called upon in sickness, and you cured me. وَعُرْيَانًا fakasani, And I was naked, I called to you, and you provided garments. وَجَائِعًا فَأَشْبَعْنِي I was hungry, you fed me. وَعَطْشَانًا farwani, Thirsty, and you quenched my thirst. وَذَلِيلًا فَعَزَّنِي Humiliated state, I called you in, and you gave me dignity. As an ignorant man, I called you. And you acquainted yourself to me. I called you alone without any helpers. And you granted me protection. I called you when I was away from all. And you brought me back. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all these things beautifully. Acknowledging to him. This is the ingredient of a successful life in which we unashamedly arrive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and begin to share with God. Now let us go through this a little bit more in order to examine ourselves. You see, sometimes there are so many complexities in there that they are cancers and they are eating away at us. 
There is no one who will accept us. And we live with this toil with ourselves. What we need here is not somebody to listen only. But we need somebody to listen and to say it is over. It is not too late. It can be converted. I am here for you. I have heard it all. Now leave it to me. And I can make it better for you. We need that level of friendship and loving relationship with God. To go to God and to give away these fears, these anxieties, these complexities. But the thing is that it takes a man to acknowledge these things. When we feel hatred and we want the destruction of the other, it is very difficult at that point to cure that situation. But at that point, if we can open ourselves to Allah and say to Allah, Oh Lord, this heart feels bitter hatred towards this person. Oh Allah, bring me through this. I need to talk with you and justify myself. Why? Because we need somebody at times to say, Yes, you are right. If I were seeing the situation from your perspective, I too would feel the same thing. But then he says, now that you have said it, do you not see that this hatred is consuming you? It is not doing you any good. It is killing you from within. Your hatred for the other is a curse upon your own self. Give it to me. Let me have this. Free yourself from within. You are right, but give it to me. And then he would say, allow me to forgive that person. Allow me to make him a person that you will love. Become like me. That is what we need deep within ourselves. Oh Allah, I talk about you, but really I'm afraid of you. I really am afraid of you. I need to be honest with you, oh Allah. O oh Allah, I say that you are the best of planners. But O oh Lord, I don't think you are planning the best for me. O oh Allah, I say that you have the fullest right. But actually I feel I have a right on you. If we can arrive at that level of honesty, that brutal level of honesty, Allah will accept us. And Allah will free us. For that is the truest bondage. O oh Allah, I am entertaining suspicion in my soul about you. I have chosen to come to you openly, O oh God. I am not going to hide away from you. Hussein unashamedly came to you. This is the unique relationship he had with you. I will have that unique relationship with you. If we can arrive at that stage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if we can be as brutally honest as Hussein ibn Ali was, then that becomes a very curing relationship. It becomes a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allows us to grow through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if instead of losing sleep at night as to what will become in the morning, if we can awaken to Allah in that moment and we can say, oh Allah, I am consumed by what will happen in the morning. I need you to assist me through this. Imagine if we can do that. Imagine if we can say to Allah, O oh Lord, these are my children. I know you can take me at any time you want and you will destine only that which is the best. But O oh Lord, I do not feel that security deep within me. Allow me to live a little bit longer. O oh Allah, I know you can test me with poverty, but I don't feel I am strong enough just yet. Do not test me with that poverty at this point. So instead of pretending and pretentiousness 
and doing all the amal that we do, what if we were to forge this relationship with God? This openness with God. What if we were to say to Allah, oh Allah, your decree came to pass and oh Allah, I'm very bitter. I'm finding it very, very difficult to accept this. And if you are my God, which indeed you are, then whatever test is destined for me in this that you have done for me or to me, allow me to come through this in the best possible manner. What I'm saying here is that even in that open relationship with God, we cannot be pretentious. If we feel angry with God, to say to Allah, O oh Lord, I am feeling very angry. I know this is not a right state because I feel it is not a right state. I'm very bitter inside myself. Forgive me, but assist me through it. Help me through this state. This is what we need to do with God to arrive at that pedestal of openness and beautiful connection with God. As Hussein said, and I'll repeat these words again before I finish, that, O oh Lord, how can I articulate myself to you when whatever I'm going to say is open to you? How may I complain of a state to you when none of my states are hidden from you? This is how brutally honest Hussein was with his Lord and this is what we need to be with our God. To cut away the formality and to come to that beautiful level of intimacy. Some of the greatest tribulations upon Hussein, as we hear, were such that the mountains would tremble and crumble had they been faced with such challenges. But the thing is that what happens beyond Hussein to the women who see with their eyes, who have seen with their eyes whatever has happened and to live beyond. And with Zainul Abidin is the real test. So here it is. He comes to see his son and to bid him farewell. Imam awakens, but his does not recognize his father. He focuses. Aunt Zainab, it is my father. Sit behind me that I may recline against you. He looks at his father and he says, Oh father, what has become of our battle with the enemy? Indeed, the devil has overpowered their souls, O oh child. And I come to bid you farewell. Ayna ammi al Abbas. Where is my uncle Abbas? Qad qutil. He has been killed. Zainul Abidin cries and loses consciousness, then regains. Where is Ali Akbar? Where is Muslim ibn Ausaja? Where are the brothers of Abbas? Child, they're all taken. Aunt, bring me my sword and my walking stick. What do you intend to do? Oh, Father, I cannot bear to see you in this state. Allow me to give my life for you. We see him on the back of a camel, Zainab lamenting on the body of Hussein, and she hears the sobbing of Zainul Abidin. She turns around with yoke around his neck, tied to the camel. He is crying to an extent that he is about to give his life. Why do you weep such, O oh child? Life shall escape you, O oh aunt. Have you seen a more unfortunate son than me, whose father lies without his head? 
burning on the sands of Karbala and I am unable to bury him. He appears on the 13th. <coughs> they are bewildered as to who these bodies are. For they are torn so badly and they have no heads. So he says, people, I shall point to you at these bodies. So they dig a hole and he says, bring a straw mat. He places the body of his father Hussein. It was torn so badly. And he places it inside, his, inside the grave. Then he asks for the little baby and places the little child upon the chest of Hussein. They come running to him. They say there is a body at the Euphrates that refuses to move. He said, he shall not come to me. I will have to go to him. He arrives at the body of Abbas. He nears him and collapses upon his knees. He says, Wa Abbasa, O Abbas. Indeed, the heavens have become illuminated and the earth has become darkened. O Abbas, if only you had seen what I have seen. If only you had heard what I heard. If only you had seen how your sisters called out to you as their backs were whipped, <laughs> as their wails were snatched. Allah la'anatullah al qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina dhalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun ilahi inna nasaluka bi haqqil Hussein wa jaddihi wa bi wa ummihi wa khi wa tis'ati al-ma'asumina min dhurriyatihi wa bani اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتبفنا مع الأبرار اللهم عجل فرج إمامنا المنتظر واجعلنا من أنساره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه رحم الله من قرى الفاتحة Thank you. So we shall now have a question and answer session. Uh, so at this point, I'll open the floor to any questions that people might have. I'll throw to Mike around if anyone needs. Uh, so I'll begin with an online question that we have. Uh, Sheikh, you have described God as, God as an intimate friend. But how do we feel the presence of the friendship of God towards us? We obviously, it doesn't come very um, naturally to many. So we have to remind ourselves that Allah is the creator. He is the nurturer. He is the one who is closest to us. So once we begin to remind ourselves of these truths, the mind begins to acquaint itself with God in that way. The next stage then is, to actually start devoting ourselves to a God that we understand that way. So when we stand at night in prayers, we say, Oh Lord, who do I have but you? Even though I do not really acknowledge that deep in my heart, but I know in my mind I do not have anybody but you. And then to go into sajda and to say, Oh Lord, I thank you for everything that you have done for me. And I ask you to be with me and not to abandon me. Even though I do not see you with the eyes of my heart, you observe me with your eyes. O oh Lord, open my heart to you. When we do these practices, what happens is that that little practice brings about that moment of mental enlightenment when God's presence is felt, it comes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Sheikh, I'll take this opportunity uh, to put my question in. Um, 
You mentioned in your lecture today, tonight about people whom the day of judgment that God wouldn't look at them. Uh, so these people who have reached the day of judgment who haven't uh, acknowledged themselves. Could you mind explaining a bit more about that? So you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He looks at, and I have these thoughts in our humanness come to us, by the way. You know, in different le at different levels of life, we go through these things, actually. You see, in our teens, we are very hidden away from God. Because we are not acquainted with God, especially if we have not grown up in a household in which God is prominently available in that mystical way. So in, at that level, we with God interact in a very pretentious manner. As we interact with the rest of the world, we are not ourselves. There is a personality that overpowers. And we act through that personality and we are not acknowledging ourselves beyond that personality. At a later age, we become ourselves and we become confident within our own skin. This is me. There is congruence between what I say and what I feel and what I am. So when you read the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Isa, Isa, did you say to the people to worship you and your mother? Isa is shocked. He says, Oh Lord, had I said it, you would have known. You know what is in my soul better than I. Isa's response is a very genuine response. Allah, you know I haven't said it. Why do you ask me? If I had said it, you would have known. And that is what is supposed to be the case with all of us. Then you read in the Quran further on that Allah says, Did you do this to a group of people? And at that point, they say, No, we didn't. So Allah says at that point, I will seal your lips and cause your hands and feet to testify against you and cause your skin to speak. And they shall say to their skin, why do you testify against us? It will say, I am helpless before the command of God. By the way, this is not a point to give this talk that this skin and everything are angels. These are all angels, these are all living beings, yes? It is only here for with us as a borrowed thing. This body is not ours. It's not ours to abuse, yes? And I've stopped smoking two years ago. I just thought I'd make a point. I just thought I'd make that point. Yes? So here now you find this group of people who are in front of God and yet they feel that they can lie to God and God will be deceived. That is the lack of acknowledgement of the self. Because they are so wrapped up in false personality that even at that point after the great tribulation of death and the awakening and the cosmic collapse, they are so gripped in this false personality that they do not emerge. So Allah says, I will not look at them because there is nothing there to look at. You are not there. How can I look at you? I will not speak with them. Why? Because I am not speaking to you. I am speaking to a falsely projected personality. You are not there. So what happens is that sometimes we go through a process of purification. And those process of purification allows us to emerge. Allah describes this in the Quran as turbulence at sea. And when they are gripped with momentous waves, when their ark is about to be torn apart, they cry out pleading to God with the loss of all formality and protocol. Oh Lord, save me. That is when the true person emerges momentarily. Under that severity, under that test. So we go through process of purification where the false layers erode and burn away. And then we become available to God after that. And But Allah says, وَلَابِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابَ Living in hell, for ahqab, which is a lengthy period of time. But that's purgatory and purification from the false self. So we begin to acknowledge our own self. Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, Sheikh, also you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, everything we're going to be 
obviously uh, in front of Allah, um, our hands, uh, everything, eyes uh, will be witness. But also we know as a Shia, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, Sayyidah Fatima, Imam Ali, also <coughs> they will be there present and they will have a role in deciding who's actually going to be the pious one or no. So can you, you know, elaborate on this, please? Now, the first thing we need to realize is that Imam Ali used to cry, yes? And he would say, Allah li ba'd safar wa wahshat al-tariq wa qillat al-zaad. He would say, how lengthy is my journey to God? How frightful is the path to God? And how little provision I have to carry with me. The one who we are learning from used to himself tremble in the awe of God. Yes? The blessed prophet used to say, my prophethood and everything that I've done does not make me eligible of God's mercy. It is the overflow of the mercy of God that will embrace me. Yes? Imam Sadiq said, we do not have any kinship with God. We do not influence God. Mend your ways with God. Now, they have a special favor with God, a special rank with God, and they have the ability to intercede. When God gives that permission, yes? But we cannot expect the Prophet to intercede for us unless there is something like the Prophet within us. So if the quality of the love of Allah is within our chest, then the Prophet of Allah will intercede for us. As the Prophet of Allah has said, that Jibrail gave me the right to intercede from Allah for every one of my ummah, and I shall intercede. So if we look Forgive me for giving this particular example. If we look at Saddam, who used to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, it's very difficult to imagine that that heart has any light of God in there. That sort of a person would not be eligible for the intercession because the Prophet stood at the grave of the hypocrites of Medina. And Allah said to him, O Muhammad, even if you seek forgiveness 70 times for these people, I will not forgive them. La taqum, do not stand at their grave of any of them when they die. Yes? So these people were munafiq. They died as apparent Muslim, but inside their hearts there was sickness. So the eligibility of doing shafara in itself is conditional. That Allah permits shafara to them for whoever is capable of receiving intercession. We must bear all of that in mind. They said Imam Hussein offered to leave Karbala and to go outside the Islamic kingdom at that time. First, is that true? If is that true, how that can be reconciled with his role to the path of Islam on the right? Mm -hmm. uh, so by leaving Karbala and going elsewhere, how that can That's Thank you for asking that question. Imam Hussein. As we said in the first talk, his disposition was different to Imam Hassan. He actually had made it clear his intention that he would stand for the rights of the oppressed. He would. Yes? He had made that very clear. And we all know from the statements of Imam Hussein that he wasn't going to stay calm and stay put. He was going to fight for the truth. This is his nature. That is what makes Hussein Hussein. And on his route, to Kufa, he said, Inna kharajtu islah fi jaddi. I have risen for rectification of the affairs of the Ummah of my grandfather. Uridan bil wa anha anil munkar. 
I want to enjoin good and prohibit evil. He says to the people, the Prophet has said, if you see a tyrant making halal, the haram of the Prophet, and haram, the halal of Allah and his Prophet, then Allah has a right to burn such a person together with that tyrant. He said all of these things. And then he said, let me be, let me go away to another part of the Muslim empire. Now, the reconciliation is here. That when the people of Kufa offered assistance, Imam Hussein left Medina. There were a few factors here. Medina demanded pledge of allegiance to Yazid. His noble principles would not allow that. Because if he were to pledge allegiance to Yazid, in the minds of the people, it would justify not only Yazid's temporal rule, but Yazid's religious rule, because people had conflated spiritual and temporal leadership together in Khilafah. He could not do that. He was duty-bound not to do that. Ya Allah lana dalik wa rasuluhu al mu'minun. He said, Allah, the messenger, the mu'minin, does not, do not allow me to pay allegiance to the like of Yazid. End of story. So, that is happening in Medina. On the other hand, the people of Kufa have invited him to lead them against a tyrannical leader. So he is leaving. Now these are the statement of his. Islah. These are the statements when he is going towards Kufa. When then he sees that the people of Kufa have retracted their support. What does he say? He says, these are your letters. You asked me to come to you. If you no longer want me to lead you, then allow me to leave you. That is when he said that. And that's a reconciliation. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. If you do have any questions, don't worry, we'll still have question and answer in the following nights. So I've got an announcement here. There are a limited number of exclusive um, pre-release copies of Sheikh Arif's new book, Islam and God Centricity. They're available to purchase in the foyer for £6.50 following the program. Card and cash payments are also accepted. Um, so on behalf of the Al Mahdi Institute, I would like to thank you all for attending tonight's lecture. The Al Mahdi Institute is a charitable educational establishment committed to serving the grassroots communities through training the future scholars of religion and engaging in cutting-edge research and translations as well as a wide range of outreach activities. As a means of sharing the human face of Islam and the message of the Ahlul Bayt, as a grassroots funded organization you are all welcome to donate to the Institute in whatever capacity you can to allow the Institute to continue its activities. If you'd like to hear more about our activities, you can also sign up to our mailing list uh, located at the table outside the chapel where our publications are also available at discounted rates. <laughs>